All right, so welcome to today's webinar, Guidance on Self-Disclosing Your Disability to Employers, presented by Disability Solutions. Today's webinar is geared towards job seekers and community-based organizations that work with job seekers with disabilities, seeking guidance on the pros and cons of disclosing a disability to a prospective employer during the job application process, the interview process, or post-hire process. Before we begin, let's go over a few things. In order to reduce background noise, all participants are on mute. However, we will have the opportunity for questions at the end of the presentation. We do encourage you to ask questions and don't be scared to share some of your experiences. You can ask publicly or privately through the presentation and we will hold them to the end. We'll provide participants with our contact information as well if you wish to contact us directly. We also like to point out that the information covered today should be used as a reference and source to make your own decision. Although we are subject matter experts in the field with experience and knowledge, this material is our expert opinions and the decision will be ultimately yours to make. We also like to thank Purple Communications for providing our guests with closed captioning. Please see the message below in your email with the directions if you require those closed captioning for this webinar. With all that said, let's get started. My name is Kevin McCluskey and I am your moderator for today's presentation. As a Director of Partnership Development with Disability Solutions, I am responsible for developing and managing federal, state, and local talent partners to meet business and hiring goals of Disability Solutions and our employer clients. I also work closely with employers to educate them on the benefits of hiring talent with disabilities and providing tools to them to help them best engage and support potential and current employees. I am a husband, father of three, and not ashamed of my admiration of Tom Cruise and being an Oakland Raiders fan. So why are we here today? Myself and our presenters today work with employers across the country again to help them find talented employees with disabilities. Therefore, therefore, we also work with job seekers with disabilities and those talent partners supporting those job seekers. Disclosing your disability or identifying as a person with a disability to employers might come with a little bit of hesitation, concerns, or simply some questions starting with why. This presentation is designed to give you, the job seeker or employee, some guidance on self-disclosing your disability to employers. Your expert presenters today are Tim Stump and Keith Meadows. Tim Stump is a vocational rehab employer liaison with Arizona at Work and one of Disability Solutions Rockstar Talent Partners based out of Phoenix, Arizona. One of the best in the business, Tim works as a liaison between employers in the state of Arizona and the vocational rehab serving job seekers with disabilities. Tim is known for his successful employment programs and career fairs, his humorous emails, and simply just getting the, the job done. When he has some free time, Tim does enjoy collecting pinball machines. On your right is Keith Meadows. He is a hiring and engagement consultant with Disability Solutions. Keith seeks to bridge the communication gap that frequently exists between community organizations serving job seekers with disabilities and employers. He works closely with these organizations to help them find the best talent match for Disability Solutions employer clients. He also manages many employer relationships for Disability Solutions, including Fortune 500 clients Airmark and Synchrony. He also conducts corporate disability fear and stigmas trainings nationwide advocating the business value and talent value of employing individuals with disabilities. Keith also enjoys bragging about his published articles on the employment of people with disabilities and collecting autographed sports memorabilia. Sports memorabilia. So a little bit about Arizona at Work. They are a statewide workforce development network that helps employers of all sizes and types recruit, develop, and retain the best employees for their needs. For job seekers throughout the state, they provide services and resources to pursue employment oppor uh, opportunities. By developing their state's workforce and matching employers with job seekers, they strengthen Arizona's economy. Tim's department, the Vocational Rehab Program, provides a variety of services to people with disabilities, and the ultimate goal is to prepare them, enter, and retain employment. A little information about Disability Solutions at Ability Beyond. 
Our parent company, Ability Beyond, is a nonprofit based out of Connecticut in New York and has provided services to individuals with disabilities for over 60 years. Disability Solutions were created roughly seven years ago as a consulting arm of Ability Beyond to help employers implement successful hiring initiatives to attract, hire, and retain talent with disabilities. Our clients across the country include Pepsi, Staples, Synchrony, Aramark, Aon, and more. Our motto here at Disability Solutions is changing minds and changing lives. We like to change the mind of employers through education, success stories, and proven methods, which results in the changing of lives of job seekers with disabilities turning into successful employees. Disability Solutions also has a career center matching job seekers with disabilities to employers looking to hire talent with disabilities. You can visit disabilitysolutionstalent.org to see more job opportunities. So we're gonna go with our first poll question today. Uh, I am, this is you, you are a job seeker or employee concerned about disclosing your disability. Are you a job seeker employer needing an accommodation? Are you a career coach assisting job seekers with these decisions or other? I'm going to launch it now. Poll has been launched. You'll see it on your screen. If you could just click and answer, It'll give you about 30 seconds or so. Again, you are a job seeker or employee concerned about disclosing your disability. Maybe you're a job seeker employee needing an accommodation. You might be a career coach assisting job seekers with decisions or other. Give it about 10 more seconds. <clears throat> All right, going to end the poll now. Look at the results. Looks like a majority of the room is a career coach assisting job seekers with these decisions, which is great. And others, about 45%. Hopefully we'll get to hear from you a little later. All right, thank you. All right, so moving on. You might have some questions or concerns about disclosing your disability. Uh, so here's here's some questions and concerns you might have. Um, there's there's different types of disclosure and self-identification as a person with disability. Um, we're gonna go over, do you want to disclose? Is it important for you to do so? Should you disclose? Who should you disclose to? How much of your disability should you disclose? What are the benefits of disclosing? What are reasonable accommodations? And we wanna remind you that you can't undisclose. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to the Hiring and Engagement Consultant with Disability Solutions, Keith Meadows, to go over some different types of disclosure. Keith? Thank you, Kevin, and thank you everybody for joining today. Uh, now, when we talk about disclosing a disability, we want to highlight a few different types of disclosure because it can mean different things to different people. Some may make sense for you and others may not. So let's start with the first type, which is self-identification, or we'll refer to it as self-ID, or checking the box, if you will. Now, what do we mean by this? You know, have you ever filled out an online job application and been asked if you are a person with a disability? I'm guessing that most of us have. You know, you can probably visualize that form now, the one that asks you if you want to check yes or no, or I do not wish to answer. We get asked this on applications, and we also get asked this during onboarding paperwork, usually on our first day on the job. You know, why do we get asked this and what happens to this information? Most job seekers we work with think that this information immediately appears magically on the hiring manager's desk, and they will know right away, first off, that they are a person with a disability before they even look at their resume. This is actually a pretty common myth. Uh, and, it's, and it's also not true. We are actually asked that question because the company you are applying for is a federal contractor, which means that they do $50,000 or more per year in business with the federal gover government. And that number is actually pretty small for most businesses. So a lot of companies are federal contractors, um, even more than we traditionally would think. Now, as part of the law, federal contractors need to hire a workforce that reflects the American population. 
And guess what? People with disabilities are included in that. One in four Americans has a disability and federal contractors need to hire people with disabilities. And this is a way that they track companies progress. More on that in a minute. This type of self disclosure information is usually only available to a small number of higher level corporate individuals in a company such as a chief diversity officer. It is much less public than the next two types of disclosure that, that, that we're going to touch on. As with all of these, we want self-disclosing your disability to be your personal choice. So next we have disclosing your disability to receive a reasonable accommodation. This type of disclosure is a little bit more public and would involve you letting your HR manager know about your disability and to make the, the formal request. You don't have to get incredibly specific with your diagnosis unless you receive that request from uh, your HR. For instance, let's say you're a person who's visually impaired and you need a screen magnifier for your computer. You could simply let them know that you are visually impaired rather than letting them know your specific diagnosis, prognosis, symptoms, um, anything of that nature. You can start general and get a bit more specific based on what additional information your human resources uh, department would request from you. This one is important because a lot of employees feel ashamed and embarrassed to request accommodations and some so much so that they will actually leave the job rather than make that request. And also on the flip side of the coin, some human resource professionals are absolutely terrified to get that accommodation request. So there's a little bit of fear of both sides, but mistakes on both ends can cost employees and companies money. So this is an, an important disclosure also because most accommodations end up being free or costing very small amounts of money. The last type of self-disclosure is one that we don't really advocate for, but we wanna to touch on because it does happen and it can make sense in certain situations. You know, we, we call it here public announcement, uh, but what we really mean by that is that you're comfortable enough in your workplace and work environment that you start letting coworkers and friends know that you have a disability and maybe you develop into a disability advocate. You know, at that point, you're comfortable letting everybody know that you have a disability. This is certainly one that we need to caution you about. You know, there's, there's a lot of awesome companies out there, but there are still also a lot of companies that aren't what we would call disability friendly, right? So you can make your own choice on this, uh, but your better plays on self-disclosure would be with types one and two that we went through, unless you are absolutely sure this one would work for you. They are more private, uh, the first two. You know, ironically though, public announcement, this one right here, is actually what most job seekers and employees think that they're doing when they check that box, uh, saying that they're a person with a disability or letting their HR know that they needed an accommodation. And we felt it important to break these out for you to draw some distinctions between the three. <clears throat> All right, so why are employees asking you to self-identify? You know, we touched on um, you know, why companies ask you if you're a person with a disability during the application and during onboarding. You know, they're federal contractors and they're legally required to ask you this information. And companies are also required to firewall off or completely separate this disability information away from your application and from your personnel file. So it's for the government's tracking purposes only. And companies are becoming more disability friendly and it's also becoming more of a, a pride play for our disability community to proudly check that box. Once again, you are not required to check yes or no. This is once again, a personal decision. You may have a disability and you, know, you may not feel comfortable checking that box and that's certainly okay. You know, we just want to dispel some of the common myths around this self ID form that you get from time to time. It cannot be legally used against you in the hiring process. And the government actually has an agency tasked with auditing companies to make sure that they are hiring people with disabilities. You can see the logo on your screen there. It's called the OFCCP, uh, which is short for the Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs. And this is where that check yes or no information about having a disability comes into play. 
So if companies don't have many people who have disabilities working for them, they can face fines from this organization and they can also face some very negative press. So currently 7% of each job group uh, at a company that is a federal contractor should be people with disabilities. So let's say you run a, a call center and you have uh, customer service representatives as one of your group. Of all your customer service representatives within that company, 7% need to be people with disabilities or people who have checked yes. So most companies struggle to get even close to that 7%, which is why employers need to be more inclusive and welcoming. Many people with disabilities aren't checking the box because they aren't quite comfortable with disclosure yet. Also, people with disabilities may not be making it through the application or the interview process. Both of these, the OFCCP is able to see when it looks into the company's information on those check yes or no on disability numbers. So let's touch on some of the benefits first to employers. Um, you know, there are many benefits to hiring people with disabilities if you're an employer. We've highlighted several here. If you are a business leader, you know, one that may speak more powerfully to you is the higher retention rate. We've seen this play out in real life with all of our corporate clients that we work with. You know, on average, we have about a 14% higher retention rate than the company's average. Our case studies are not unique on this, and we've seen this play out all over the country. You know, this means that you're interviewing less, you're spending less money on turnover. You may ask yourself, why is the retention higher? In many cases, if you think about it, you know, a person with a disability is, is pretty battle tested in the game of life, right? They've often had significant hurdles to overcome to even think about employment. They face discrimination. They've learned alternative ways of accomplishing tasks and they've developed unique and valuable viewpoints. You know, people who are battle tested in life usually translate into great employees as well. So someone who had to work harder to gain employment is less likely to let that go very quickly, right? And people with disabilities can also do any job, entry level all the way to CEO. Uh, those who think otherwise are really perpetuating the stereotype. And people with disabilities also cut across every different ethnicity and diversity group. There is no group unaffected and one in four Americans has a disability. So oftentimes when we talk to companies who are looking to increase their diversity hires and you know, they kind of view disability as kind of this separate uh, off to the side group. And really there is no group that isn't affected by disabilities. So we want you to keep that in mind. And I believe benefits to disclosure. Kevin, did you, I'll pass it back to you for this one. Thank you, Keith. All right, so benefits to disclosing. So there are there, there are pretty much many benefits to uh, disclosing, and an employee as a major benefit to disclosure is that you can get an accommodation that you need to perform the job, rather than trying to tough it out or either leave the job or get fired. If you know you need an accommodation related to your disability that would help you perform, put that request in. People who disclose their disability actually stay on the job longer, and uh, Tim will get to that a little bit more in a bit. You can also help decrease some of those myths and stigmas, decreasing some of those myths and stigmas typically associated with people with disabilities. Some companies tell us that there are not people with disabilities working for them. Laws of averages show that is untrue. Again, one in four people in America have some type of disability, it just doesn't go away with one company or a company company by basis. But having honest conversations about disabilities can help with inclusion in a culture. So once again, it boils down to a personal choice. So let's throw it over to Tim Stump, our wonderful, great community talent partner in the wonderful state of Arizona. Tim? Thanks, Kevin. Um, so um, you have to ask yourself, do you want to disclose? So there are many things to, to keep in mind. Uh, for one is disclosure is a personal choice. So it's up to you whether you want to disclose or not. And you have to ask yourself, what are you looking for by disclosing? Um, do you know what accommodations are needed to perform uh, the task of the position? Um, we have a job coach with you at any point. If you're gonna have a job coach with you, Basically, that the fact that you have a job coach has disclosed for you. 
Um, do the other circumstances disclose for you? Um, I uh, job coach in an interview, a uh, interpreter, um, the fact that, you know, as soon as you walk into the room, you're going to have a visible disability and the employer is going to know. Um, so you make sure your clients, if you're a counselor or a job coach, make sure you give your clients informed choice. Let them know the benefits and the drawbacks of disclosing and, and when to disclose and how to disclose and, and if they're going to disclose what it is that they're looking for in terms of accommodations, um, that kind of thing. Next. Okay. So should you disclose? Uh, you have to ask yourself, do you have a visible or invisible disability? So a visible disability is a disability that employers are going to be able to observe as soon as you walk in. Uh, if you walk, walk in and you have a wheelchair or you have an interpreter um, or you've got a cane or a, a, a guide dog, they're going to notice. So all of a sudden, you have to ask yourself, if you haven't disclosed to that point, which you can still not disclose, uh, you don't even have to tell them when they see that. But at that point in time, they might be focused more on the wheelchair or more on the service animal than they're focused on what you have to say. Uh, so an invisible disability is one that might go unnoticed by an employer. Maybe they'll never know. Um, maybe you have uh, depression and they'll never know that you have a disability unless you need to um, ask for an accommodation later on. So when will you need accommodations or will you need them at all? So will you need them for the interview? Will you need them for training? When will you need them for on the job? Uh, next. So to whom do you disclose? Uh, I find human resources is usually the best choice to disclose. Uh, they usually have a lot of experience with accommodations. Since they're working with a lot of people within the company, <clears throat> they know how um, those accommodation requests have been handled in the past. Um, do you yourself know what the accommodations you need? You know, you need to remember that employers know how to make things or provide services. They're not experts on disability. Uh, sounds like we actually have a lot of experts on disability on the call today. So that's that's our job to know about that. An employer, uh, their job is to to make things, is to sell things, those kinds of things. They're they're not in the business of of disability or accommodations. So uh, I also find if you have an invisible disability, a lot of times disclosure is best after getting the position. So at that time, you've already gotten the position, you can ask for the accommodations and uh, you're a little bit more likely sometimes to have gotten the job in the first place. Next. How much to disclose? I would say in general, you need to disclose only enough to keep the accommodation, to help get the accommodations necessary to perform the job. You don't ever want to start over disclosing or start telling war stories uh, about your past. So uh, I lo love the, uh, uh, the visual that, that uh, Kevin provided here. There's uh, all the information you could share, and then there's a little dot about what they really need to know. Uh, you need to keep it professional, and you always want to remember that you can't undisclose. Uh, whenever you, you say something to an employer, it's out there. Um, you can't take it back. Say, well, no, I, I, I don't have that disability, or I don't need that accommodation. It's like, you made that request. It's, it's out there. Next. So <clears throat> on how much to disclose, is this a position where you need to disclose? Uh, peer support positions, um, it seems like they've changed over the years uh, and you might need to disclose. You might need to have a, a lived experience. Um, <clears throat> and what they're looking for is the fact that you can discuss your disability with others for therapeutic benefits. Um, and they want to make sure that you're not going to be triggering their clients. So uh, maybe you've got uh, PTSD because you live with an abusive spouse and you start talking about what you went through and how you got beat so bad you had to go to a hospital and you're talking to uh, a client and that triggers them. And it's like, 
you can go ahead and express that you've lived through something similar to help them therapeutically without triggering it. You don't have to go into the war stories once again. Next. So what are reasonable accommodations? Uh, in general, an accommodation is any change in a work environment or in the way things are customarily done that enables an individual with a disability to enjoy equal employment opportunities. And that's from the EEOC. Uh, that's their enforcement guidance on reasonable accommodations. Um, so that's, that's the definition that the EEOC is using. Next. So common examples of accommodations. And, uh, you know, Kevin, you did such a great job on that last picture. And uh, this one's a little more trickier to, to, to puzzle out here on a Monday morning. But uh, you'll see the first one is a work schedule that you might need an adjustment in a work schedule. Um, might be access. You see these changed to, to two doors um, or a modification of some sort. Um, and it's actually on this one, it's a transfer. And it looks like print only, but that's nice. But it's actually a, a printer. And what they've done, if you see it, is they've moved the start button down to the side or added a start button. So, um, so common examples of accommodations can include job coaches, flexible schedules, assistive technology, ergonomic chairs, uh, use of a service animal, working from home, additional time, uh, reassignment to a vacant position, uh, accessibility to work and offsite events, uh, readers, interpreters, um, be JAL software, can be some apps on an iPhone or uh, another type of app on a different phone. Next. So we're not, a, what are not a reasonable accommodations? Uh, so removing essential job functions, uh, diluting uniformly enforced productivity standards. So you still need to, to be as productive as what their standards are. Uh, excusing or forgiving past misconduct. Uh, what that can mean is, is if you weren't doing so well in the past and then all of a sudden you, you disclose and that's not going to forgive those past or poor performances. Um, uh, it can't be a promotion. They can't say, well, since you can't do that job, your accommodation is that you get a promotion. Uh, can't be bumping another employee from a job or creating a new position or job. Um, can't be changing an employee's supervisor. Um, but it can be changing the supervisory techniques. Um, next. So I think this is the second time or third time I've said this. Uh, I'll probably say it a couple more times. Um, you can't undisclose. But once you've disclosed at an employer, you have disclosed. They know that you have a disability and you need an accommodation. Um, so that one person, like if you go to HR, that person will know they might have to tell other people that you do have a disability or what accommodations you need. Uh, and I would say discrimination, uh, although I've been in this business now 17 years, uh, it's a lot better than it was in 2002. Uh, discrimination is still out there. Uh, and also, I think a lot of times, not just discrimination, but um, going back to if you have a visible disability and you walk in to a place uh, for an interview and they see um, a service animal, all of a sudden, the employer is focused on that. It's not even a discriminatory thing. It's they're thinking more about the dog than they're thinking about what you have to say. That's, that's sort of more of a human nature kind of thing. Um, so another possibility is people might look at you differently. However, one good thing is once you've disclosed, you're protected by the Americans with Disabilities Act. So, next. Oh, good. So, right. uh, yeah. Kevin? Yes, yeah, so that really concludes some of the content section of our webinar today. Uh, again, as, as I said in the beginning, we will have some time for some questions. Uh, just want to let you know Disability Solutions does have two upcoming webinars geared towards job seekers and talent partners that serve job seekers with disabilities. The first is what employers need job seekers with disabilities to know on May 21st at 1 p.m. Eastern. The second is 
is the second installment of this webinar, what you just heard, with Tim Stump again, guiding on disclosing, guidance on disclosing your disability to employers. The next one will be June 4th at 1 p.m. Eastern time as well. You can register online. Uh, before we get into the Q&A section, um, Tim, do you have any good experience about, um, you know, any any success stories of, of working with job seekers who disclose disability for an accommodation or anything like that? Yeah, I I, I do think that, uh, and we probably should add a slide on this about the benefits of disclosure. Um, it, well, for one thing, um, people who do disclose tend to keep jobs longer. I also think that there's a lot of employers now who are actively recruiting people who have a disability. Um, one of one, the better ones I, I think of here locally is, is Synchrony Financial that you guys have been working with. They've hired well over 30 people uh, knowingly who had a disability. Um, you know, I think of some other companies who, who are doing that as well, uh, not to mention, you know, the Ability One contractors um, that are out there. We've got one here, a large one that's employing 300 people. Um, you know, I think more and more companies are reaching out. Um, I think one of the main problems of, that we have, um, our clients have, is they haven't been working. So, an employer looks at their resume or their application and they see that they have not been working for the last few years. Uh, so they don't hire them. And it doesn't have to do with the disability. They don't even know they have a disability because I think a lot of our clients don't disclose. It has to do with the fact that they haven't been working. So I've had a few employers that I've been able to contact and let them know, hey, you know, this person hasn't been working because of their disability and they've made sure that they've gotten in for an interview. Excellent, thanks, Tim. And so this is, this is Kevin with Disability Solutions. Again, we work with employers across the country, and one of the first things we do when we, we kick off a project with them is uh, dispelling fear and stigma training for their HR leaders and their, and their leaders in general. And the number one thing that comes up several times throughout the training is accommodations. So a lot of employers have this fear that accommodations are going to cost them lots of money or they're going to change everything. Um, when we talked about it earlier, it's, it's reasonable accommodations. So accommodation shouldn't you know, bankrupt the company. It should, it should be a reasonable accommodation that helps that job seeker be successful. Mm -hmm. And what we learn and teach uh, to these employers is they're providing accommodations to people without disabilities already. Um, so it's really just kind of business as usual for some. Um, some might be a little trickier if you have, you know, uh, maybe entering JAWS into your system uh, to make sure it's compatible or, you know, d different things that could be a little more harder, but majority of individuals with disabilities don't need um, that huge of accommodation. Um, that's a really going to be a huge problem for the employer. So that's what we teach. And we also work with um, organizations such as um, Arizona Work and Tim to help with those accommodations. There's also lots of funding out there to help with accommodations. So, in our work with different businesses and employers, we do work with them um, to, to come up with a good solution and a reasonable accommodation to help these job seekers that do need them. Um, one success story we've had is uh, two actually with Pepsi. Um, down in uh, one of the sites, um, working with an individual who was hard of hearing and uh, he was working as a merchandiser, basically uh, stocking shelves, uh, for Pepsi, getting the product, you know, from the back room out into the shelves and, and building displays of product. And um, there's a little bit of concern of him being, what if, uh, what if a customer of the store approached him, he wouldn't be able to help them figure out where to go. Um, of course, him knowing his disability, he was able to say, hey, you know, I've, I've got apps on my phone. I got, I got an iPhone and I'm able to use that app to communicate with individuals. It's not that hard. And we were able to show Pepsi and his supervisor how it worked, and it, and it worked just fine. Uh, another one is we, we worked with a company that had, most do, an amazing amount of different acronyms that, for some reason, people, it's it hard for them to figure out. I, I would struggle with that myself. Um, so another thing is we just downloaded a PDF of those acronyms onto his iPhone, and when he needed it for his job, which he did often, he was able to just flip open his phone and, and, and be able to look at it as a reference, and he would learn it over time. Um, some individuals are able to memorize them immediately and be able to be successful. This individual had a learning disability, 
and it took them a little longer to do it. So just having that, I mean, it's, it didn't even cost anything. It's just uploading a PDF to his phone for easy access. Um, so small, small accommodations like that just to help individuals be successful. Uh, we also had with Pepsi out in Las Vegas, we hired, uh, we helped them hire two individuals who were deaf um, into one of their, their uh, certified setters. And what was really cool about that is again, they struggled to communicate with some of their, um, some of their coworkers. And what they did was every morning at their team meeting, they learned a new sign. They, te they taught their coworkers a new sign um, basically related to, you know, some of the questions or information that would come up on the work floor. Um, so that was another great way to not just accommodate them. It was actually a great way to um, help them employees without disabilities understand to be able to work better with their coworkers. Um, so there's a few good stories of really knowing what the job seeker themselves needs. I mean, just because one individual has a certain disability doesn't mean it's going to be that accommodation will be successful with that individual. So knowing your disability, knowing what accommodations are needed to help you do the best in your job or your job seeker um, can really go a long way. And um, we'll jump into questions real quick. I just want to throw it over to Keith um, for some of his stories with uh, Synchrony and, and the JAWS software. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. I just wanted to, to touch on, you know, uh, you know, a lot of times there's this uh, fear about uh, when we talk to uh, companies about people with disabilities equaling accommodations. And really, as Kevin mentioned, what we do is kind of go through uh, disability fear and stigma training and, you know, open their eyes a little bit to like, you know what, you make accommodations on a daily basis for probably everybody that works for you, whether they're coming in five minutes late because they had to drop off their kid or whether they needed to leave 10 minutes early to take care of some other business. Those are actually accommodations. Um, and that really kind of opens the eyes to, um, you know, folks in the corporate world. But, you know, to those job seekers with disabilities out there, you know, I don't want you to settle. Um, you know, a lot of times people think entry level jobs uh, and kind of lower paying jobs are like where people with disabilities traditionally start. And if you've got the experience and you know you've got uh, phenomenal qualifications you can do any job that you want you don't have to apply for a specific you know entry level just to kind of get your foot in the door it's it's the lowest unemployment in i don't know how many years uh, so employers are actually reaching out and they want to find top talent so don't settle you can you can actually have your choice of employer. So I encourage you to do your research, do a deep dive on your resume, um, know your qualifications inside and out, and really find an employer that, that fits your needs and has a culture that you like. Because uh, we touched on it earlier, some uh, companies are incredibly disability friendly, like Synchrony, and they really value that diversity and the unique approaches uh, that people with disabilities bring into their culture and makes them better as a business those are the type of businesses uh, that you'll want to find out and they're out there as well um, and I just don't want you to be, to be limited by that and you know just to go back to, to Kevin's question you know we've we've worked with uh, Synchrony for a while and you know it's getting JAWS software onto their computers uh, was actually a, a pretty easy lift and we uh, used uh, Goodwill and local community-based organizations to to help with that and I think there's I think five individuals uh, who are completely blind using JAWS software nationwide with Synchrony and it continues to grow and it's just an example of how all organizations can can work together and we can get some folks back to work and doing some great things and, and being able to provide for their family. All right, thank you, Keith. Uh, I'll throw this question out to Tim and Keith. Uh, what about people on workers comp? and have a disability such as a back injury with or without surgery, shoulder injury, et cetera. Accommodations may be to sit, stand at a desk, extra breaks, headsets, et cetera. What about disclosure regarding this worker's comp? Employers are shying away from someone who has a work comp injury. Tim McKee, you want to answer that? Or? I can answer that, Kevin. Sure. If that's okay. Yeah. Uh, well, I would say um, going back to the chart that uh, Kevin had uh, painted so expertly with what employers need to know uh, versus everything else, um, I'm not sure that, that uh, letting an employer know you have a workers' comp claim is something that they necessarily would need to know. Uh, you know, they need to know what accommodations that you're going to be needing. 
Um, I would think uh, depending on when you're going to need the accommodations is how you're going to disclose. I also think it's different. Uh, while I say some employers are getting great, and I do think that synchrony is fantastic, I, I would not hesitate for anyone to disclose to them because I think they are doing a fantastic job. I think you're working very well with them. Um, but maybe other employers, you wouldn't disclose anything until you actually needed that accommodation. So maybe they need that sit stand desk afterwards. I would have them go ahead and go through the interview process maybe with a company and then ask for it once they got hired. You know, it would depend. Like I said, they might be having trouble finding a job and they might find an employer like Synchrony uh, or another one who's actively recruiting people with a disability that they would disclose beforehand. But I'm not sure that, that you know, disclosing that they have a, a uh, workers' compensation claim would be what they need to do. Yeah, Tim, I'll piggyback on that. I, I agree. Saying you workers' comp, there's some some words that have automatically a neg negative label to them. So workers' comp is kind of one of those. Um, so we 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 coach job seekers going into interviews. You know, don't give the other side of the table any opportunity to think of anything negative. Um, workers' comp again is one. Um, there may be, you know, you may go for a job and you might mention your kids for some reason and the personal information that might trigger on the other end being like, oh, they have kids. So they might call out if their kid are sick or something like that. That's kind of unreasonable, but you got to think of what the other person might think about on the other side of the table. And you don't want to give them any, any negative leverage, I guess I can say. Um, so, but about the accommodation, you know, the, the part about the accommodations is, yeah, like, some companies are able to give that opportunity for extra breaks and headsets and, and that stuff. So that, like Tim said, should probably come after the fact once you get into the job and see what you need and then request those accommodations. Um, those, those are able to be, um, in, in most cases, those are able to be accommodated. Again, also when it comes to accommodations, it, it's got to be, the accommodation has got to work for the business needs. Uh, for example, you know, synchrony is a call center. So there's a time that those individuals need to be on the phone um, to, to take those calls. And in there, there's extra breaks and stuff like that. So just make sure when you're, you're looking at the accommodation to know really the job, know really what you need, uh, and, and kind of balance that out to be able to do your job successfully with that accommodation. I hope that helps. If it doesn't help, uh, please uh, feel free to um, send it again. Thank you. All right, so we, another question, Tim and Keith, I have a client with severe anxiety, so not a visible disability. Would you disclose this or would you just make sure that she or he is well coached and feels confident in their ability? I can go ahead and start that one, Kev, thank you. Um, I would say, you know, once again, we go back to it's a personal choice. Uh, if it was me, I would feel a little bit more comfortable with, you know, checking yes, um, you know, on that self ID box, but I'd probably be a little bit more hesitant unless I knew a little bit more about the company or its culture um, as far as self, uh, you know, disclosing my disability. I would also need to know would I, you know, with the job that I'm applying for, would my anxiety, um, you know, lead me to need to request a, a reasonable accommodation? If so, um, at that point, you would want to uh, make that request rather than what we see with a lot of folks is, uh, you know, if they need like a, a reasonable accommodation, sometimes, you know, it's intimidating to ask and, and a lot of people will, will leave that job rather than th make that request. Um, so ultimately, it's a pers personal choice. But if you feel that, you know, a reasonable accommodation is needed to do the position and be able to succeed, uh, we would encourage you to make that request. Hi, hi, Kevin. This is Tim. Uh, I've actually ran across this kind of thing before, and one of the things I would do is is do a lot of mock interviews. Um, I would uh, start yourself working with your client. I would do some mock interviews, and then I would go ahead and uh, maybe have one of the people in your office uh, do some mock interviews uh, with your client and get them more, you know, as prepared as possible. As far as disclosure, I think it would depend on the company. I think there's some companies that, you know, if you're going to disclose to the recruiters and uh, talk to them directly about it, uh, I would say, you know, obviously Synchrony, but I would say, you know, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, 
um, some of these other companies. Uh, maybe there's some other ones you work with that would be fine um, so that they could do what, what they can that would make somebody feel more comfortable. Uh, in the interview, uh, maybe it's getting them the questions in advance so that they don't have any surprise questions uh, if they're able to do that, uh, or maybe make sure they have uh, them printed out uh, during the interview. Uh, if they can go ahead and have one person interviewing them instead of a panel, maybe that would help. Um, those kinds of things. So, Yeah, and again, finding the right job for the right person. Uh, if you don't like kids, you know, working in child care is probably not a good fit for you. So uh, trying to find those right jobs for that individual has anxiety. You don't want maybe a, those stressful jobs that are really hard might not be a good fit for, again, so finding the right fit for that individual uh, that certain disability. All right, next question is kind of one we're kind of familiar with if you uh, follow the news in the disability world. Uh, I have a young lady who has worked in a current job for over nine years as a greeter. Job description was recently changed to add on duties of retrieving carts. Consumer has to use wheelchair for mobility and has limited ROS and limited use of her left arm. Can she be given accommodations for that position since she has been doing it already but cannot do the new task. Tim, I'll throw it over to you first. Do you have any insight on that one? Uh, well, I, I think like we were speaking before, essential functions of the position. I mean, the, the, the title of the position is greeter. Uh, that would be the, the most essential function. Uh, the every, everything else I think would be secondary. So I think that, you know, she should talk or you should be talking, you know, if, it, if it's okay with your client, if you can talk with her. Uh, to the employer about uh, getting some accommodation so she can stay on the job. Excellent, I agree. Keith, anything to add on that one? No, I would say I would say it's a Tim hit the nail on the head there. It's it's definitely a worthy conversation to have. All right, we still have about eight more minutes. Any more questions, please feel free to type them in. Oh. All right, the question is, what is the definition of reasonable when it comes to reasonable accommodations? Um, I, I think, you know, they always refer to, is it um, an undue financial hardship? And from what I've seen, it's like it's almost never judged to be that. But if you had a small enough business and it was going to cost thousands of dollars, or if it's going to change the very nature of things, if if somebody can't see very well in the dark and you have a nightclub and lighting that place up would not be a reasonable accommodation. So is it going to essentially change everything about that company? Is it going to produce an un undue financial hardship. One of the things to remember, <clears throat> and one thing I think employers need to think about a lot more is um, that branch manager, that person who's running, let's say a, a Wendy's or something, and I don't know for sure about Wendy's, but, but uh, probably, uh, the, the budget for accommodations comes out of that particular location. Whereas if they're getting any type of credit, uh, for the work opportunity tax credit, it's coming to corporate. So you have a lot of times a manager that, you know, they're thinking about how they can buy a new car or whatever with their bonus. And all of a sudden somebody comes in, they need all these accommodations and they think, well, there goes my bonus, you know, and it's not going to be ruled by the EEOC that it's an undue financial hardship because they're looking at the company overall. So I'm, I'm hoping that answered that a little bit. And I would agree. What we also see is, you know, most uh, accommodations end up costing $500 or less too, with the majority of those being even free. And so, you know, as Tim mentioned, it's, it's, you know, a little bit of a gray area, but you know, it, if it's very dramatic and would place undue hardship on the business, then it would be unreasonable. You know, if you requested like an entire new building to be built, um, you know, for business as an accommodation, obviously that's, that's an undue hardship, right? So there's a little bit of a gray area, but um, you know, I think most businesses would agree with the fact if they're able to get 
a high performing worker who sticks around at a job um, and has high productivity, the investment for a reasonable accommodation, most, most employers are going to jump on that in a heartbeat. Uh, I used to be an employer myself and I would take that individual, uh, an individual who would perform and, you know, um, you know, have a higher retention who may need a little bit more of an investment up front any day of the week versus somebody who kind of jumps in and, you know, leaves a month later and I'm constantly trying to fill that position because all of those costs add up too, right? Um, you know, I'd rather take the chance on a great employee. And also mm -hmm. one, one uh, I'm sorry, one, one client we had had a, uh, there was a warehouse and had a scanner and a headset uh, in order to do the job. That's where all the, the information came down to to process the information and, and complete the task at hand. And um, there are individuals who are hearing impaired or deaf couldn't do that job because there was no accommodations of that system that was used in the warehouse. Uh, so the, the accommodation would be to replace the whole system. Um, we, we did a lot of research and tried to figure out how to make it work and there just wasn't a, uh, a good solution. Um, so it wasn't reasonable for them to change that. Um, also, if uh, then same thing, the warehouse, if if there's heavy lifting required and that individual has, you know, maybe a shoulder injury or something, it's not a good fit for them. Uh, or, and they that, that's not a reasonable accommodation just because they can't, you know, physically do the job uh, and lift that materials that you wouldn't be able to say, hey, you know, I have a great worker who would be great at this job, but they can't do that physical limitation. Well, that is really the job. So um, th that would not be a reasonable accommodation as well. Tim, something to add there? Well, I was just looking at the next question. Uh, if we have time to, to answer it. And I, I'm, unfortunately, I, I think I have to give the answer I give too much, which is yes. Um, the question is, uh, I have a visually impaired client that is losing his job because he has to now transition from Zoom text to JAWS and is not supported on their network. Uh, is this typical of the software or is the employer overlooking ways to accommodate? And I would say yes. From what I've seen, um, many employers, um, th they have trouble moving from Zoom text to JAWS. Uh, their software um, requires a lot to have them do that, but I've also seen employers that are willing to, to go out and make those steps necessary so that um, their software can utilize JAWS instead of just Zoom text. And I, I know Synchrony is one of them. Uh, I know Peckham, Peckham is, you know, is a uh, Billy One contractor. They spent over a year, they hired somebody and then spent over a year trying to figure out a way to make JAWS work. Uh, so it can work, um, but there are a lot of employers who just sort of draw the line there. And a good way we found out, I think it happened, at, you know, when we came in working with Synchrony, we started helping uh, different sites use the JAWS software. But later down the road, we found out another site actually did a way back and, and really did some great investigative uh, research and worked with uh, the individuals at JAWS to figure out how it does work in their system. And we're able to kind of uh, put together a plan moving forward with uh, employees who came onto the job and needed that software. Um, so my recommendation is understand the, the equipment used with that employer and then reach out to JAWS and see if there's any um, way to work with that and integrate it into their system. Um, sometimes again, again, it takes knowing you're the professionals in that field, if they're professionals in their field. Um, so a little research and um, could, could go a little way to helping your um, job seeker or I guess a current employee um, become successful. All right, I have one. Uh, what are some uncommon or unique accommodations that you've seen provided to employees in the past? That's a great question. Again, what are some uncommon or unique accommodations that you've seen provided to employees in the past? Well, one of my favorites, Kevin, is I had an employer who, uh, when he called the uh, job seeker, the job seeker said he was very nervous and anxious about the interview and asked if he could bring his father as a job coach. And the employer said yes and uh, interviewed a young man with his father there, and then he hired both of them. Yeah, that's great. Great, Keith, any, any stories you get? 
I would say less on the uncommon side, but just more opening employers' eyes about incom- accommodations in general. Um, just taking the flip side is, you know, the employers just, when they hear the word accommodations, it just, it terrifies them and they, they go to that, like, oh my gosh, I'm going to need to build a new building or like something incredibly dramatic, but just opening those eyes as to like, you know, you make accommodations for almost every single employee on a daily basis really kind of levels that playing field and opens their eyes as to um, accommodations in general. And one I can go to is uh, goes back to Pepsi in Las Vegas. Uh, it's kind of an accommodation, maybe, maybe not as much, but we, we put together a wonderful training program working with uh, Nevada's VR before the facility actually opened because it's a brand new facility. We were able to work with VR and some other local organizations to put an on-site soft skills and hard skills training together. Um, so we brought, you know, the, the book rehab did a great job of working with job seekers and see who might be a good fit for this position. Uh, then we brought them on to Pepsi. Pepsi was able to lead some training and kind of educating on them what the jobs will be all about, what's Pepsi all about, what's this facility all about, really a lot of good educational um, classroom kind of uh, learning. And then we were able to do some hard skills, um, a little background that the facility basically takes coolers, bedding machines, and fountain drink machines takes them apart when they're broken or damaged, takes them apart, scraps them for different parts, scraps them for metal, and puts them basically puts them back together and they come out almost brand new on the other side of the facility. So they come in damage and they come out great on the other end. Um, so basically what, what Pepsi is looking for is people to be able to use a screwdriver or a wrench. And after anything that it was, they could teach them. Um, so we were able to go in and tinker with some of this equipment and you'd see some individuals who absolutely would not get past your typical corporate um, Pepsi interview stage going through the typical questions, but we're able to do a great job at what the job actually was. Um, so you'd have individuals who really lack those soft skills, but they were able to go in and, and show Pepsi that they could do these jobs, take apart these you know, uh, machines and put them back together, work on the coin slots where the dollars go in. Um, we had one individual who had a really hard time. He was uh, individual was deaf and also had a lot of learning disabilities um, and a lot of um, communication abilities. Uh, and and he was able to come in and, and take this take this equipment and, and take it apart and put it back together, clean it and put it back together, just as probably the best they've ever seen. As well as the comment was, he's like, I've never seen anyone do that so fast. That was amazing. Um, and that individual would struggle if he just typically went went through the regular interview process. Um, so there we were able to work with the employer uh, to put that training program together and they saw the value of that individual rather than going through the, the typical process. So I, I would put that as a kind of a unique accommodation that was provided um, in that state and that in particular employer, um, which was one of my favorite parts of what I've done in the last couple of years. So we are about three minutes over the hour. I don't see any more questions coming in. I'm going to uh, end the presentation, if that's okay with everyone. If there's no more questions, I will leave uh, Tim's information up there and Keith's information up there for a few minutes. If you want to jot that down and reach out to us. Um, if you're interested in um, attending some of those webinars that we've mentioned before, you can see under Keith Meadows, uh, contact information is www.disabilitytalent.org. You will find uh, some great information on those webinars and some other um, resources as well. So I want to thank you all. I want to thank Tim. Thanks. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, thank you, Keith. And thank you all for attending, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks.